but General Gorgo had lost no time, having lost longer to special permission on February 13th, 1818. He had sailed straight for England on March 14th. On May 1st, Plymouth was sighted, and on the 8th, he was allowed to land. The following day saw him in London, where he interviewed the Under Secretary of State for the Colonies. And then the French and Russian ambassadors, by the end of May or the beginning of June, all the cabinet had been notified that the emperor's illness was a farce and that the measures taken to prevent his escape were not strict enough, as he could leave as he liked. At the same time, by means of an intercepted letter, Lord Bathurst learned that it was the intention of Las Casas and certain friends of General Bonaparte to call the attention of the sovereigns assembled at Aix-la-Chapelle to the treatment to which he was subjected at St. Helena, and he hastened to provide Lord Castlereagh, who was to represent England, with the necessary weapons, which were first and foremost the communications made by General Gorgo upon his arrival from St. Helena. And these disclosures would be all the more pertinent and received with greater favor since the sovereigns were already inclined to establish a connection between the attempted efforts to ameliorate the lot of the captive and to obtain another residence for him and the state of Europe in which, above all else, they perceived the symptoms of a dissatisfaction which they could not attribute to their administration and for the responsibility of which they found it easier to hold the man of the revolution, the permanent leader of the huge conspiracy of peoples against their lawful sovereigns. Las Casas wrote, I have devoted myself wholeheartedly to flooding and assaulting them with the trees and information. I have written to Marie Louise. I have charged with laying before the sovereigns a letter from Madame Mir. And all the other relatives must act on their own, and I myself have most carefully assembled for each of the sovereigns all the authentic extant documents, and have drawn up a relevant note sent to themselves. It was not sent to Lord Castlereagh, to whom I did not deem it necessary, because he only represented the King of England. And the Council's causes pompously made known these letters sent to move those by whom they were received in that which he had written under the name of Madame Mer. He had not even known how to observe the simple and dignified style the situation demanded. And as for the note and the letters he wrote under his own name, the extravagance with which they were expressed almost reached the heights of delirium. What did it matter? Had they been the most touching, the most eloquent, the most perfect man could have written, the result would have been the same. On November 13th, the Russian plenipotentiaries laid before the Congress a memorandum, which was apprehended to Protocol 31, in which they appealed in no uncertain manner to the evidence of General Gorgo. Napoleon, according to him, Gorgo harassed the governor of St. Helena, only that he might the better conceal his real intentions. Secret correspondence with Europe and the transit of money took place on all possible occasions. The plan to escape has been discussed by the members of his suite, and it would have been put into execution had their master not preferred to postpone it. As to his health, he says he's ill and refuses to see any other doctor than him who has become his accomplice and who has never even been able to certify the general board apart is not suffering from a serious or faint disposition from which a few days' exercise would not cure him. The verdict was complete approval by Europe of all the steps ordered by the British government and carried out by the governor Hudson Lowe, with the exception that the restrictions should be more strictly enforced, that further precautions should be taken to prevent the clandestine correspondence disclosed by Gorgo to forestall the escape, which Gorgo considered so easy. The European representatives of Austria, Great Britain, Prussia, and Russia, with the Duke, to Richelieu, representing France, unanimously adopted the resolution in the six articles intended to legalize, ratify, and tighten up the captivity. They first of all unanimously approved the ideas presented with as much truth as necessity in the memorandum of the Russian plenipotentiaries, and since it suited their purpose, they discredited the lying reports broadcast on this prisoner's behalf by act of malevolence and compiled by party spirit or credulity. They and they made their solemn decisions.
And this was a result in Europe of a prattling of Gorgo, for whom, in extenuation, it could only be said that he was perhaps under the spell of certain temporary delirious ravings, and that he gave voice to statements which were beyond mental conception. At aix la chapelle Gorgo's denunciations affected a stricter confinement of the prisoner and a captivity thereafter without hope at Longwood. It was the emperor's very existence which they put on trial upon the return of the curse with Lowe's dispatches announcing what Lord Bathurst called General Gorgo's confession. The governor received instructions to enforce between the members of General Bonaparte's suite and the residents of St. Helena all restrictions, which appeared to him necessary to prevent the continuance of secret correspondence if the members of his retinue do not comply with the new regulations, wrote Bathurst. You are to forbid their associating with General Bonaparte. On May 9th, Goulburn received Gorgo. On the 16th, Lord Bathurst of opinion that the reports made by Mr. O'Meara are very untrustworthy and that in view of the information given to Mr. Goldburn by General Gorgo to the effect that the health of General Bonaparte has in no way suffered by his residence in St. Helena instructed Hudson Lowe to terminate O'Meara's ministrations and to forbid him all further relations with the residents at Longwood. Admiral Plampin received the necessary instructions for his future destination and as the removal of Mira will produce a great sensation, and as an evil construction will be put on the affair, Law was permitted to make known his orders in general terms, so that if he was sent away, it was because of information given by General Gorgo in England concerning his conduct. That was not all. Long was distasteful to the emperor. He ardently desired a house where there was water, trees, shade, and flowers. There was such a one at St. Helena at Rosemary Hall. He had not formally acquainted the governor of his wish, but he had many times let fall the hint to others that Low, on his behalf, was in negotiation for the purchase or tenancy of Rosemary Hall. Low had gone so far in the matter, moreover, that he was only awaiting the formal approval of Lord Bathurst. When the latter wrote, I hope my dispatch concerning Rosemary Hall will reach you before you have completed the purchase of it, General Gorgo considers Longwood as the place best suited to strict supervision. Lord Bathurst's orders were carried out on July 25th. O'Meara received instructions to leave Longwood immediately. The emperor had been paying his entire salary, but that made no difference. The governor sent a man in Napoleon, Dr. Furling, to take the place of O'Meara. The latter, violating orders, got into Napoleon's room, gave him certain vague statements upon his health, received his instructions, a message for Empress Marie Louise, and precise directions regarding the publication to be made of the letters which the sovereign had formally sent him, and which he had kept as a last weapon. Lowe had been wanting to deport O'Meara ever since January 5th, holding his hand only in face of a crisis created by the emperor, the doctor being possessed of a gift of 100,000 francs payable by Prince Eugène or King Joseph. His future was more than amply assured by the Bonapartes, but he had certainly to exert himself to get his money. Having arrived in London about mid-September, he hastened to impart the facts he had witnessed. I believe he wrote on October 28th to the Secretary of the Admiralty that the life of Napoleon is in danger if he lives much longer in a climate like that of St. Helena, the more so if the dangers of this residence are increased by the persistence of those vexations and outrages to which he has up till now been subjected and to which the nature of his disease renders him particularly susceptible. By way of reply, the Admiralty informed him on November 2nd that his name had been erased from the list of naval surgeons. He had unreasonably attributed his fall from favor to low and provoked in some measure by an officious pamphlet, which certainly emanated from the colonial office entitled Facts illustrative of the treatment of Napoleon Bonaparte of St. Helena early in 1819. He issued a volume published by Ridgeway and entitled Exposition of Some of the Transactions that Have Taken Place at St. Helena Since the Appointment of Sir Hudson Lowe as Governor of that island, wherein well-selected documents accused the governor in a particularly compromising manner, immediately translated into French and published in Paris in July. This book enjoyed enormous success, and the ministry could neither contradict him 
nor dare to prosecute him. The London conclusions are very unsteady. Lord Bathurst wrote to Lowe, adding that you will with satisfaction have perceived that despite all their publications and their threats, no one has dared to open his mouth in Parliament in Bonaparte's favor. O'Meara's efforts seem to have stopped there in February 1820. This time under his own name, he issued volume nine of the historical memoirs of Napoleon, which had been brought to him in the previous October from St. Helena by an Englishman who received 10,000 francs for his trouble, and which was nothing more than a different version of the campaign of 1815, of which Gorgo had, despite the emperor's opposition, brought away a rough draft and published it in 1818. What made O'Meara's publication interesting was that the emperor, though he did not know he had to thank Gorgo for all the persecutions he suffered, had definitely considered spiting him by the dispatch and publication of an authentic text of the campaign of 1815, the form adopted for publication, the insertion of the imperial arms on the title page, the announcement that the eight first volumes of these memoirs historique would appear within a few weeks, all proclaimed the authenticity of this edition and nullified that of Gorgo, and it has remained the best and the only recognized issue. It met with poor reception, however. What the public expected from the emperor was not a historical narrative, dry and strategically barren, lacking all antidote and all decisiveness, with no disputes about supplies of provisions in St. Helena, nor about such and such restriction upon walking on forbidden ground. It was but a general survey. A kind of confession, lacking explanation, and sensational disclosures, a destiny such as his assumed an enigmatical shape, the secret of which everyone wanted, and that was why. At the same time, as the public was showing but little eagerness for the publications which really emanated from St. Helena, it had literally fallen for that manuscript venue de saint hélène June and Canoe. Why its curiosity had not been satisfied by the issues which appeared one after the other in England, Belgium, and even France. Why thousands and thousands of faithful adherents struggled to copy this poor pamphlet, which boasted neither attractiveness, style, nor ideas, was because in a few handy pages of a lively and precise nature the long anticipated disclosures were found. And these gave considerable satisfaction since they corroborated previously acquired opinions. The emperor had understood so fully that the manuscript knew the saint led connate everything and that it gave birth to a particularly deep-rooted religion that he had specially commissioned Omir to issue reasons given in reply to the question. It is manuscript de saint Alain, printed in London in 17, 1817. The work of Napoleon or not? This reply saw the later day following the historical memoir, Book 9 in 1820. The French edition was entitled Memoir Persevere à l'histoire de France en 1815, but did not live up to its title. General Gorgo Dow has gained the credit for their appearance since they followed a work very similar to that which he had brought from St. Helena, so much so that he took it upon himself to publish them in 1821 under the title, The Manuscript of St. Helena, published for the first time with notes by Napoleon.